Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hey. Um, welcome to Columbus Metro Club. Founded in 1976 by 13 fantastic women leaders, CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversations. To carry out this mission, CMC explores public policy issues, current events, and lessons in leadership at forums like this one every week. From its foundation, CMC has welcomed everyone. I'm Amelia Robinson, the opinion and community page editor at the Columbus um, Dispatch. I'm so very happy to also be a member of CMC's board of trustees. I'm so pleased that you are all with us today. So give yourself a, a big hand for coming out to learn. And we actually have someone who has come out as a new member for the first time. We have a very short new members list. We want to welcome to the team of CMC's uh, membership, Brian Duff, who is with J.P. Morgan Chase. So let's all welcome Brian. Are you here, Brian? I don't think Brian's here. If you're not already a member of CMC, well, what is your problem? We um, need you, um, we want you. Um, membership to CMC is open to everyone, just like the Columbus Metropolitan Library, which came around 150 years ago. That's something, right? Have had this gem in our community. You will save on uh, form fees if you join us. You'll also get one of these fantastic green badges. Isn't it sexy? Come on. So if you want to become a CMC member, it's very simple to do. You can um, visit Columbus Metropolitan, I'm sorry, Columbus Metro Club org and sign up. You can also talk to Lainey Colbert, who is, um, where are you at, Lainey? Lainey, we all saw when we came in, she'll also hook you up on how to become a member of CMC. Please take a moment, take a moment to look at the back of your form flyer. There you will find many, the many generous organizations that supported your not-for-profit Columbus Metro Club. We could not exist without them. And if you want to join them, you can talk to Lainey about that too. Speakers, speaking of support, um, I want to thank our uh, sponsors today. We have Columbus Foundation. We are also grateful for the generous support of the Centers for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation, and of course, the Columbus Dispatch, which is 152 years old, so we beat you, library, there you have that. Um, we uh, provided today's live spring for today's event. Um, let's also uh, thank all the sponsors who are in the form flyer. Thank you. So now we're gonna get to our uh, com conversation for today, uh, America's Public libraries have long been held up as pillars of free speech. They are also getting caught up in the crosshairs of the culture wars that are ripping through our nation. Initiate, um, initiatives to take controversial books off library shelves are now new, not new to Ohio. 
and we'll hear all about that today. But recent years have seen unprecedented rises in the number of titles under fire, according to the American Library Association. What happens when demand for censorship collides with libraries that are based on free speech? Today, we'll explore the critical role libraries play in our democracy and how libraries are working to preserve intellectual freedoms. Please welcome our fantastic panel. We have Matthew Messler, Bessler, who was principal with Bolick, B. Messler, and Gleesha. I told you I was going to get it wrong. I tried real hard. I practiced at night. Bolick, thank you. We shall say it together later. We also have Michelle Francis, who is executive director of the Ohio Library Council. Patrick Lewinsky, who is CEO of Columbus Metropolitan Library. Felton Thomas, Jr., who is executive director and CEO of the Cleveland Public Library. And our moderator, who is David Weaver, who is executive director of the Ohioana Library Association. You can read all about them in your form flyer. So now I'm going to turn it over to David. It is all yours. Thank you, Amelia. Let me get to the right place and pull out my glasses. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm, I want to say a special thank you to Amelia and to Doug Buchanan for inviting me to uh, moderate to this. Um, as I told Doug, I had planned to have my entire staff here, which includes Courtney Brown, who just won the book, <laughs> and Catherine Powers and Mary Minard. We were going to come here anyway because of the topic, so I was thrilled to be given the, uh, this chance to moderate this fantastic panel. And uh, as, uh, as we open, we just want to imagine how different would America an American democracy be without free and open libraries? Would we even be a democracy? Um, libraries have played such an integral part throughout our history and uh, have always been uh, so important um, in the role of education for all of our citizens. David McCullough, the great historian, um, liked to note that in America's worst economic crisis, the Great Depression, no public library ever closed its doors. And so, as Amelia said, with America's public libraries held up as pillars of free speech, yet at the same time being caught in the crosshair of cultural wars, we are seeing now challenges like we have not seen before, but they are nothing new. Both in America and in elsewhere, we've seen in news media reports, both locally and nationally, that efforts to challenge books and libraries are alarmingly on the rise. In fact, the American Library Association reported in 2022 that book challenges doubled from the previous year. And so, my first question to our distinguished panel, why? Why are these challenges increasing? And what do those who are behind them, what are they seeking? You, you guys are the librarians. <laughs> I'm just a I'll, lawyer. I'll, I'll start. Um, let me first start by thanking the Columbus Metropolitan Club for uh, having this panel and uh, inviting me from Cleveland to come here. And a congratulations to my friend, uh, Pat Luzinski and um, uh, Columbus Metropolitan Library System for 150 years here, only four years behind Cleveland. But that's, <laughs> that, that's another story. Uh, I think it's the end of the story right now. <laughs> but I'll start, and I think why this is happening now, and I, there, there's a, a number of reasons, but I'll start with librarians, associations tied to libraries. We all like lost um, our way. We just kind of took our eyes off the ball, right? Um, I was reading a quote, and I won't tell you the library director, but she was talking about the fact that they were challenging a, a book in her, her community. And she said, well, they've been doing it to schools. I, I just never expected them to do, come after the library. I was like, why? Why would you not expect them to come after the library if they've been coming after schools for the past two decades, right? And so um, there is a concerted effort to attack government. And libraries are just probably one of the later groups in, in that effort to kind of destroy um, a sense of 
ideology that they, a lot of folks just don't agree with, which is fairness and righteousness and, you know, and um, a, a sense of inclusiveness for everyone to have their voices heard. Um, and uh, we have, as libraries and as associations, been way behind in our efforts to fight this off, so far behind that we are fighting uphill now, right? You, you would never see this, and you look at another example with someone who will, like another association, and the um, National Rifle Association has somehow been able to fight off all of the, you know, any form of thing, and yet the libraries are seeming to be getting run over by these challenges. So I think first and all, I'll say, and I'll turn it over to the rest of the panel, we just missed our, our opportunity to catch this early on when we had an opportunity. Well, go ahead. First of all, oh, see, my microphone is on. We were worried, okay. So, um, so first off, I do wanna just thank, obviously, the uh, Columbus Metropolitan Club for having us uh, here today and all of our wonderful librarians in the room, because I know we've got lots of libraries here. Uh, the last time we were here was actually four years ago, um, not here, but over um, at the at Confluence Park, to talk about architecture in public libraries and about public library buildings and facilities and how they are the center of the community. And for those of you who forget, that was pre-pandemic, right? So a lot has happened since then. And the past couple of years, people have been very angry for some reason. I don't know why, probably because of the pandemic, but whatever. And so uh, people have been very angry. And the, as David mentioned, you know, the idea of challenges or, or people questioning things, that, that's not anything new. We have had that. We had that in the 90s. We had it in the early 2000s with the introduction of the internet and all of that. But what's different now, I think a little bit, also has to do with we just came out of a pandemic. People were mad about masks. They were mad about having to stay at home. And then on top of that, we have social media today. And that's, that makes a big difference because you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have that where you could be in your own little silo and your own little tunnel with like-minded people and be angry about something. So now a lot of times what we're seeing today, the people who are upset, who are, who are calling and being rude to library staff because they got an email that told them to be mad, and because they saw something online, they may not even live in your community. They may not even live in the state of Ohio. They may be in Texas or Iowa or Idaho, but someone sent them something or they saw something on social media. A lot of times they probably didn't even, haven't even read the book and they're mad because someone told them to be mad and they wanna be mad at somebody. So really that's, I, I think, a different piece to what we're seeing today. I guess if I were to add to that, it's one, to remember that, yes, it's always been present. It's just so much easier to be organized on a national level now and create momentum around it. And I, I think that's a big game changer from um, just the normal course of things. Because over the course of the years, and, and I think it's important when we talk about challenges in libraries, we talk about challenged items and banned items. I know those can easily be lumped together, but they're really two different things. So if a, an item is challenged, but it's retained by a library, it's not actually a banned book. People might have wanted to ban it, but it remains uh, open and accessible. I also think if you, if you uh, track the trajectory of this current movement, it did start in schools. And really, we're just a part of the overall political environment of what's happening. So I don't think it's, here's something special about library. It's the context of what's happening socially and politically, and libraries are, are just a, a natural outcropping of that. But it started in schools, and it's also an important difference here to make. While in school, the schools act in loco parentis or in place of the parent, but in a public library, they do not, right? So there's a big difference there in terms of the public forum versus the school forum. They both have public in front of their name, public school and public library, but maybe I should toss that to Matt to talk a little bit more about, um, I practice law on the side a little bit, Matt, so. <laughs> 
Well, I, I, you know, I can't speak so much to why now. I read the newspaper like everybody else, and I watch news like everybody else. To me, though, this is this is a new chapter in a book, no pun intended, that that goes back two thousand years. Your know, fear of the written word is as old as the written word. It dates back at least to the first first Chinese dynasty and probably before. Uh, and at every step in history along the way, those in power, autocrats, tyrants, those with a societal uh, advantage, use suppression of speech and ideas to keep that advantage. And the problem is that history teaches us that those who begin coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating dissenters. That's a famous quote from 1946 from Justice Robert Jackson. Uh, and it's true. So it may not seem like a big deal to ban Charlotte's Web today, but it really is a slippery slope and we need to look at history to decide, are these the types of governments we want to live under? Uh, because if nothing else, one day the shoe's going to be on the other foot and you may be the person trying to suppress speech now, but you won't be forever. Well, Matt, that leads right into the second question, which I, I specifically want to ask you as, as, as the, an attorney dealing with the issue of civil rights, and that is, if these people would succeed, what would be the implications for the First Amendment? I mean, obviously, um, as part of our Constitution, we have the right to petition, <laughs> but there's also the right to free speech, and it seems like these things are, are really in conflict. I mean, and what these people are trying to do is subvert the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I can't put it any better than that. I mean, we, could, we could talk about what the First Amendment law is, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. But fundamentally, you're right. And it's, it's just what we talked about. It's, it's um, an effort to suppress dissenting thought because speech is power. And, you know, if we can just stop people from thinking about anything that we don't want them to think about, then we can stay in power forever. Obviously, the problem is you can't suppress an idea. Uh, but if we start going down that road, and, and the courts, to their credit, have been jealously, jealously protective of the First Amendment and libraries in general, uh, because we know from history where that road leads. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in there? Well, uh, I, I guess what I would add to that is um, we talk about the organized efforts by members of the public. Libraries are really organized as well, right? We're very well networked together and um, we share the stories with each other. The Digital Public Library of America, of which all of you can access their materials, um, they have a site, Brooklyn Public has a site, Seattle, where they're putting banned books online, right? So it, it, we're, we're really in these kind of crazy tactics right now, sort of back and forth. We're gonna take this book out. You're not gonna prevent access to that book. Um, recently at the San Diego Public Library, a group came in and checked out all of the Pride display books in June and said they're not giving them back until the library agrees to destroy them or to take them out of the collection. I think within three days they had 15,000 in donations to replace the books, right? And so this is the kind of like gamesmanship that is going back and forth. So at the end of the day, um, I don't know how we resolve that. But I would ask the audience, you know, it's a question that we can't answer, but just to reflect upon, given today's political environment, if public libraries didn't exist, could we form them today? In philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> going deep on us. I think you were going to say something. Well, Michelle. I was just going to say, I think if you go back to the, you know, the philosophy of what we've talked about, and it is above most, well, almost every Carnegie library, talk about being open to all. And, and that's what we do. And you talk about the, the, the First Amendment and the freedom to read. That is at the heart of, of what we do and what we believe in. Um, you know, number one, first and foremost, we provide services, libraries provide services to everyone, period. That's everyone. That doesn't mean you have to like everybody in the library. That doesn't mean you have to like every piece of material that you see in the library. I'm not the first one to say it, 
But many librarians believe if they have something in their library that offends someone, they're doing their job because there's always a place for everyone in the library. And it's not just books, we've talked about books, but also programs, services, displays. That's one of the things that we've seen a lot of complaints about over the past couple of years. We just came out of June. What, is, what do we celebrate in the month of June? Pride Month. So from day one, it's like all of a sudden, it's an avalanche of people who all of a sudden are like, well, they didn't have a problem when we were celebrating, you know, whatever history month or whatever. Now all of a sudden they're mad about the pride display. So it's things like that that we're seeing more of today. But I think it again, if you take a step back, we are open to everyone. One of the, and I, I've told them this before, when I first came into this job, one of the first things a library told me was that the, a librarian told me was the book that she had to buy the most of or replace the most was the Bible because people, there were certain people who felt like the Bible should not be in the library. So they would hide it or they would check it out or, or whatever. And so um, I, I think it's on both sides. Yeah. And if I could say just one thing to what Matthew said, I think what we recognize is there may be a, the top 10 uh, items that are being um, banned across the country. Most of them are, nine of them of the top 10 are folks of color. All of them are LGBTQIA um, supportive. Um, and so, but that transitions and starts going down to where you start getting Charlotte's Web, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, uh, the Lorax by lumber companies because they don't believe in the concept of the Lorax. You know, so everyone starts to put forward why they think some books shouldn't be there. And then you're just running out of having a situation where you have no books because somebody is always offended by something in every book that we have. Well, it kind of like uh, uh, draws up exactly, Pat and I have talked before, one of the uh, favorite expressions that uh, Pat Lozinski is very proud of is that three words you pass under to enter the Columbus Metropolitan Library's main library, open to all. And that just doesn't mean open to all people, but open to all ideas, all beliefs, um, all points of view. And I think a lot of time uh, people do forget that. So, and as we were talking about this, uh, are the books that are really being challenged today ones that are on transgender and, you know, gays and, and everything of that nature? Is that what it was 70 years ago? 70 years ago, we were going through a similar period like this, but the books being challenged were quote unquote subversive, pro communist. Everyone was frightened because it was the height of the McCarthy era. And uh, in a commencement speech on June 14th, 1953 at Dartmouth College, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was practically the only person who was not afraid of Joe McCarthy, said this in his commencement speech, don't join the book burners. Don't think you are going to conceal faults by concealing evidence that they ever existed. Don't be afraid to go into your library and read every book. I think that's still pretty good advice, is it not? And uh, so now as we're looking at it, it's not communist, um, but something else. Um, so, so what is it, what are the challenges most that we are seeing? Specific authors or specific themes? Um, well, first of all, I wanna say if, um, if you wanna do an author a favor, challenge his or her book because <laughs> sales are going through the roof for them at that point. Uh, well, we actually brought a selection, so if you'd like to wear a, a sticker that says, I read banned books, we can check some of these out, but come up after the program and take a look. It's really a little bit of everything, and I don't know what ALA says, close to ALA is the American Library Association, I think is saying there's about 2,000 challenges within the last calendar year, so that's really spiked, and those are 2,000 um, different titles. But I think we are seeing a, um, an emphasis of or a um, interest in uh, attacking sort of the uh, LGBTQ books right now. That seems to be a little bit of a spike other than other areas. I don't know, Felton, if you would agree with that. Or yeah, not. no, absolutely. That's the top of the list. But uh, also um, folks of color. I mean, people are trying to kind of change history. And so... Um, you know, Bluest Eye, which has been out for a number of years, is 
always either at the top or the second on the, the list of books that are, are being uh, challenged. Uh, and any books, you know, right now, um, you go to Texas, any book that, or Florida, it's any book that speaks to history of African American life. Um, they're trying to say that that's not the way it happened or that, it, you know, people should be happy about enslavement, right? Uh, which is just completely crazy, but they're trying to put that into overall into the curriculum for our young people. I think one of the, um, well, I do think it is the majority of, of those titles. We do have some crazy ones sometimes, and I'll just share a couple that just, it just blows my mind. And I don't know the exact title of it, but I know one of the books that was actually formally challenged that where someone actually completed a reconsideration form to go through the formal process was a book about the poop emoji. I'm sorry. I, had, I mean, I'm just like, really? So, um, but even a few years ago, we were actually uh, working with a legislator at the time who loved to read to his daughters. He has three daughters. Um, was re loved to read to them every night when he was back in the district. That was their thing. And they loved the Captain Underpants books. That was something that they always read together. And we had him come, and, and he was a member of leadership at the time, and we had him come to a story time. And he said, Michelle, I cannot believe, what do people have against Captain Underpants? Like, is it that? And it's everybody, they were upset about it. They felt as though it was inappropriate, not only for their children, but for other people's children. And, and that's the piece what this goes back to. No one, no one should have the ability to dictate what you, what me or my children or my, what we have access to. That's not their job. And so that's really what it comes back to. But the ridiculousness, like we were talking earlier about Harry Potter, um, you know, some of these titles that have been be uh, beloved. Yeah. I mean, I took my daughter to see To Kill a Mockingbird because I think that's very, very important. I mean, we're talking about, you know, um, amazing works over the years. And so it just shows you how absurd some of these things are. I can go, I mean, the absurdity can go even further. I mean, there, uh, you know, there have been a lot of school districts across the country uh, where people have challenged the dictionary and because it has offensive words. And of course, what, what better way to ensure that children have a full education than by keeping them as far away from dictionaries as possible. Uh, and there have also, you know, it, it is, from what I read, primarily books about LGBTQ issues and disenfranchised groups, but not entirely. Uh, I mean, there have been books that have been challenged on both sides. You know, Uncle Tom's Cabin and Huck Finn have been challenged on both sides for different, different reasons that we can, we can uh, imagine. Uh, and then, you know, outside the library context, but related on college campuses, there have been a spate of challenges to uh, conservative speakers because of their ideology and and you know understandable that people wouldn't want to hear those those ideologies those hateful voices if they're espousing hate but you know no, nobody's got a monopoly on on free speech or attempts to ban free speech so, oh go ahead no I was just gonna ask Matt asked me earlier what was the, the most ridiculous uh, challenge that you received at your library and you we've gotten some just the normal ones but this one was like somebody requested this algebra book be kicked out and and i, I so i called the person who was a kid he's like it's just too hard <laughs> it's just too hard you shouldn't that book shouldn't be in your library i think you misunderstand the whole concept of challenges right Oh so David, I, you know, it might be helpful just so that the audience kind of understands, well, what process does a library go through when an item is challenged? And I say a library, but I look around and I see Bexley and Worthington and Westerville and probably the other libraries from Central Ohio. We're, we're really blessed to have great library partners throughout Franklin County and Central Ohio. But so someone, um, when someone actually fills out a form formally to re, re uh, recon to have us reconsider an item. It also includes, well, what would you like us to do with the item as well, right? And um, we try to create a little bit of friction there so that it's not just a, a librarian on the floor who's going back and forth with a customer and having that argument. So if you're serious about it, fill out this form and we'll run it through the process. And it's a process. 
for us, that process is um, uh, Laura, who is our collection management director, assembles all of the professional reviews that might be available on that particular title. And oftentimes that's four or five. So they're looking at Publishers Weekly and New York Times and Library Journal and others. So we get copies of those. So we know what critics have said about um, the item. Then we go into our library system and find out how many copies do we have of that title and how many times has it been checked out. So typically we'll say with the 18 libraries that share our consortium here, there are 93 copies and it has circulated 765 times since it was added in 1999. And then uh, we also have uh, we're in the presence of OCLC, and Christina is here. OCLC, this great resource that was birthed right here in central Ohio, in Dublin now. They have the largest database of library materials in the world, so we check how many libraries have this book in the United States. And we gather all of that information and send that back to the customer along with the library board's approved policy on access to materials and our material selection policy. So they get a load from us. But part of that is to take some of the, the air out of the passion around this. But I also see each one of those as an opportunity to educate because oftentimes the person who's challenging say, oh, that means something that I really treasure could be challenged as well. And so most times that works pretty well, but you know, ultimately if a, a, a customer disagreed, then the Library Board of Trustees would have the responsibility for ruling on that item. And it's important for folks to know that. And Pat, I see you actually have some books here, right? Uh, aren't those books that you actually brought, I was thinking, or? Uh, uh, you, you're just saying I only read these bands. Oh, oh no, <laughs> yeah. no. I was thinking that you had brought some titles. Yes, um, our, our team, I said, just go online and take a look at some titles that have been challenged nationally and let's just bring them in as a display. And I think it's just good to illustrate, frankly, the, the continuum of challenges that public libraries face and to reinforce um, one of my favorite quotes about libraries being one of democracy's best kept promise, right? And, and this is evidence of it. Excellent. And, and I wanted to say, actually, Pat, I went this morning on the Columbus Metropolitan Library catalog uh, to check out Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. Her debut book launched a career that ultimately led to a Nobel Prize in literature is regarded as a classic of American literature, and yet consistently shows up on so many lists as one of the most challenged books. And so I thought I would check and see what the bluest eye stats were at CML. 93 print copies, of which 55 are in circulation currently, 13 ebooks, all of which are out with 21 holds, and two large print copies, both in circulation with three holds on that. Um, so obviously challenges have not stopped the bluest eye, at least in Columbus, uh, from being read. But I, I wanted to uh, ask that very question, which you just mentioned. Um, do you find that when books become controversial or a challenge, it actually drives up the readership? <laughs> it has the exact opposite effect? If I could on that one, David, I'll just kind of start um, just because, well, and again, we are in Ohio. Did you know there's a Toni Morrison Day in Ohio? We have that now. That's an official celebration. So um, I'll go back to an author that, that we've had the pleasure of hosting here in Ohio, and I know several of our libraries have as well, uh, Jason Reynolds, and who obviously um, has an amazing, uh, has done amazing work and has amazing titles and has written uh, great works, and, and kids love him. They just love him. And, you know, every time he gets the question when he's being interviewed about, you know, for any of his titles, if they're challenged or banned, isn't that great for sales? And his response always is, well, probably, but it's really sad, too, because at the same time, that means that that kid or a kid or someone is not going to have access to that book. Yes, there may be others that will, will help donate or, or bring in copies, 
but there is that means that some child, some kid, someone is not going to have access to that book. And that's really what's sad. I mean, yes, it, it does probably have a tendency to drive up sales. And I, for the people who think that they're going to hide a book or, or check it out and the library is not going to get another copy, I got news for you. That's not how it works. So um, the librarians find them. If you hide them on top of the stacks or stick them in a different section, they're going to find them. They're going to put them back in the right spot. Um, if you think you're going to check it out and if you happen to still have late fees or, or whatever, the library is going to order more copies. It's not as though they're, it's not going to, they're not going to, they're going to make sure that their members or that the patrons and the individuals in their community still have access to that material. Yeah. Just to that, I'll say I had uh, George Johnson, whose uh, book, All Boys Aren't Blue, has been in the top 10 for since it, it it came out and he is, he said, I've made a lot of money off of that book and those guys have helped me out. Thank you very much, he said. And he, but he said to that, he recognizes it, time is, it's only so much time that this is going to be out there and that they're gonna do, you know, be after them because they will find something else to go after. It'll be Colin Kaepernick this month, it'll be so-and-so next month, it'll be someone else. Um, so, uh, he recognizes that this period of time of what's happening around uh, the banning of books uh, is, he hopes, will be short-lived. And um, he's got some interesting stories that have been chased after in airports and other things um, by some of these conservatives. So, um, you know, but he, he recognizes that it's a, there's a plus and a, a, a minus that comes along with it. The sales part of it, um, you know, challenging a book sort of sanctifies the message. It, it gives the book uh, greater meaning and status to people because, wow, if this book is so important that someone wants to stop me from reading it, I better find out what it's about. It's like you tell a kid, don't open that drawer in the kitchen because it might have candy. Well, is that okay? End of story. The kid's never going to think about that drawer. Uh, you know, of course not. It's why censorship at the end of the day, although it's an effort to control people's thoughts, it just doesn't work. David, just uh, kind of a little bit of a segue here. You know, we, we have processes in place. We're able to handle this. And frankly, I feel there's there are less issues in urban areas than there are in some of the small towns. And Michelle might talk about that. But also in the current political context, you just can't deny the blue state, red state issue that's going on here. So um, on the red state side, well, uh, in Arkansas, this session of the uh, of their general assembly passed a law that if a librarian or bookseller is found to distribute material deemed harmful to minors harmful to minors um, misdemeanor with up to one year in prison for doing that so the central you know i said libraries are connected the uh, uh, little rock library central arkansas library is trying to gather money to help with their lawsuit against the state on this particular issue. I know there's a town or two in Texas where the library board has been, uh, may be appointed by the mayor. All of them replaced, library director fired because of their not wanting to move in the direction that the community thought they should. Illinois recently passed a, um, a law that said, if a public library bans a book, they will lose their state support. And you know, that's, that's just kind of where, where we are right now um, in that context. So we're seeing some regionalism, if you will, to, to even further complexify this issue. If I could add to that, David, I will say there was a, um, a survey last year that the American Library Association did, and I am gonna have my cheat notes on this to make sure I don't screw this up. So, um, but the survey that they did, and again, I think they did it early in the spring. So it was, you know, usually sometimes around primaries, things get really hot, right? So, um, but last year, 71% uh, of, of voters opposed the efforts to remove books from public libraries. Notice I didn't say ban, I said remove books um, from public libraries, 71%. Now, if you break down and I am I'm not a statistician, I can't get into all these surveys, I know there's always interesting things, but if you break it down, of those, 
the Democrats, 75% of Democrats opposed removing uh, books from public libraries. Republicans that participated in the poll, 70% of Republicans opposed uh, removing books from the libraries. And incumbents, it was, it was 58%. So it does give me a, a little bit of hope because I do think this really, at the end of the day, it should be a nonpartisan issue. I mean, because what we've talked about, we've talked about um, the Bible, we've talked about other pieces. A couple years ago, the publisher, it was the publisher who actually decided to remove some titles, uh, Dr. Seuss titles, the publisher, not the library. And that became a hot, I know we got questions about it at the state house. And I thought, well, if you're going to get rid of Dr. Seuss, the Toledo Lucas County Public Library has an amazing children's area. Guess what it's all themed with? Dr. Seuss. So if you, you know, it, it, it's on both sides, but um, unfortunately, more recently, it does seem to be a little bit more. Let, let me just speak to some of these laws. Um, I, and I don't want to allay your fears because we all should be very alarmed about these laws. The Arkansas law uh, will not stand. Uh, that is a clear violation of the First Amendment. And unless the courts decide that they're not going to follow longstanding precedent anymore, which I'm sure none of us can think of a recent example of that, uh, that law must be stricken down, and I think we should expect that it will. But then they'll get smart, and they'll figure out the next law. And you poke, you poke at the wall long enough, you figure out a way to get through. Thank you. Thank you all. It's uh, CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. Mantra Moody, who with uh, WCMC, is going to curate questions from today's live stream audience. And for those of you who are here in person who would like to ask a question, please join Mantra at the microphone in the back of the room. Out of respect for others, please keep your questions brief and to the point. We can get as many as possible. Um, questions do end with a question mark. <laughs> so, uh, so please make yourself over there. And Mantra, what uh, do we have a question from our live stream audience? Yes. So thank you, Dave, and thank you to the panelists. Um, so this is to Matt. I understand your father argued a famous Ohio book banning case in the 70s. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, first of all, that's clearly a planted question. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yes. So my dad, Howard Besser, was a civil rights lawyer. And in, in 1975, a group of five students in Strongsville challenged the school board's uh, removal uh, of some books and, and refusal to put some books in the library. It was Catch-22, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, and um, Cat's Cradle. So these students brought that challenge, and uh, the case went to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and, and the court, relying on this notion that students have uh, a First Amendment right to receive information. I'm sure you've all heard the famous quote that students don't shed their right, First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gates. So relying on that notion, the court said, no, you, you, there's a difference between requiring the school board to put a book in the library and removing a book from the library because you don't agree with the message. And the court said, you can't remove a book from even a school library just because you don't like the message. And, and it was the first book, first case of its kind to have a removed book put, put back into a school library. And, and I know that um, my dad was extremely proud of that. And so obviously... Uh, I am too, and, and book banning has a special place for me. Thank you for that question. Um, sir. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Lemichuk. So we call it public library. So my question is, if we take out books, movies, um, a lot of things are public. So does the government state have records to the stuff we take out at your library systems? And how long do you store that information? Does it get erased over? over a certain time because we don't not have we don't want to have somebody take out as an example uh the communist manifesto and all of a sudden you get a text saying welcome comrade how how is that stored deleted etc there's a few of us that want to talk to you after the meeting <laughs> um I, I i'm going to lean on a little bit on on michelle and matt on this as well but there's actually a state law that keeps um uh, library records confidential and when you bring back an item it breaks the link now 
library system allows you to see if you would like what you have checked out over time. That's a choice that you can make or you can clear it. Um, but it's not something that uh, can be obtained by authorities actually without a subpoena. Actually, it's Ohio Revised Code Section 149.432. <laughs> um, one of those subsections, but yeah, it is. So, uh, but patron privacy is protected um, with to a certain extent. There are a couple of exceptions in there. Um, obviously, if, if, a, if a child or if someone is in imminent harm, um, there are a couple of exce exceptions, but usually it is for a court order or subpoena for where it would have to be released. But uh, we take patron privacy very, very seriously. Very seriously. This question Mantra. is... Another question you. from yeah. the live stream audience. Yes. This question is from Richard Needles. Are there any books or categories of books that have or should have an age requirement slash gap guidelines to be accessed, similar to movie ratings? <laughs> well, I'll speak that up because I, I think in um, Texas, they're just putting forward something. Um, they just put forward a law. Actually, I think it's yesterday in which they're requiring that some schools put forward ratings for, for, for movies. I think what we do as libraries and as collection development professionals is determine where the book is best situated to go, right? Our collection development folks will say this is the best for someone who is a teen or best for an adult. Um, and so we work with our collection folks to try to put our items in the best area they are, they, they are deserving to be in. Yeah, I think it's tough beyond that general guideline to come up with the criteria and who would be the judge of what goes in the restricted categories. So, you know, we would tell you the public library has worked exceedingly well, 150 years and 154 in Cleveland. Um, and so I, I, I think we, we don't want to overreact to this. It's working really quite well and, and as. Hi, my name is Nidhi Satyani and my question is for all the panelists. Um, so first I want to say thank you. I believe libraries, parks, and public education um, to amend the quote that you gave earlier. Mr. Lazinski is, is really the fulfillment of dem democracy. It's not just the libraries, but I love the libraries. Um, my question is about partnerships. So I have the privilege of serving on my local board of education and we face, as you've mentioned, many book ban conversations and that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about ways that public education systems can partner with our public libraries to address this issue? Well, I, uh, thank you for the question. And uh, we would view the 10 school districts that we serve as sort of premier partners because we think our, our role in the out of school time education space is just really critical to the community. Uh, and sometimes we dabble in the in school time as well. And so uh, a couple of things that I would point out um, for the last five, six years, we have been delivering a uh, bin of reading materials to 400 classrooms throughout um, central Ohio in the school districts that we serve. And I, there's talk about trying to double that amount. So um, public and even charter schools, these are kids who are part of the, the overall constituency of the library. So we're trying to provide those materials. We try to make it easy for uh, educators to check out more materials with educator cards, they get special privileges. And something we're really excited about, and this was uh, funded by a number of grants, including the Department of Education, uh, over the last 18 months as a response to coming out of the pandemic, we have about 40 summer, uh, well, they started as summer, now we call them school reading assistants. They're actually library employees who are in the elementary schools assisting the teachers with time on task with children who might be struggling as readers. Our reason for doing that is we're trying to, again, coming out of COVID, trying to reestablish the connection and the relationship that we've had with children to make sure they have a library card to introduce them to the summer reading program, to the after school uh, help center. And so uh, I, I think we're doing a lot. The other and final point I would make, 
it's a little bit complicated, but we're all also doing some uh, dissemination through eBooks as well that might be available for children to download while they're in the in uh, the school day. So Michelle, you can uh, give me the maybe the exact number closer than I'd be. About 150 of the 251 library systems are school libraries. I don't have it off the top of my head, but you're probably close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So by by that that the they are attached to their school system, school educational system or board of education. So we are as as Cleveland, we are under our school board. So there is a very close connection between us and how we work with our schools to do that. And about 150 library systems are, are similarly attached in that same way. Thank you. Another question from our audience. Okay. Um, this question is from Trip Lazarus. What are the criteria for a title to move from challenged to banned? Well, I think I'll kind of start off and then you all can, can add in. Um, I think you have to take a step back because again, each public library should have a collection development policy. And within that collection development policy, there and some of them are pretty extensive because you have to keep in mind, each library system, while they're very similar, which by the way, Ohio has the highest library use per capita in the nation, in case you didn't know that, there's a good factoid there. So, so we are very proud of our public libraries. But, um, but while they're very similar, they're also different in the sense that each one serves their own local community. So there may be some things that are specific to each individual branch, even within a system that maybe um, the other branches don't have. But each library system has a, that collection development policy. Some are pretty extensive, some are not as lengthy. Um, within that is the reconsideration form and that process that that library system takes into consideration if and when they receive a, 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 a form for reconsideration. And I will say again, what we've talked about today and what the American Library Association has reported, there are very different, there are some people who have completed an official form for reconsideration. There are others who have just yelled at the librarian because they were mad about the display. There are people who called and hung up on them on the phone. There are people who posted on social media. So there's a wide range of people and types of complaints versus the actual uh, filing of the reconsideration form. I just want to say hi to Trip Lazarus because he's a very dedicated homework help volunteer at Northern Lights. <laughs> but also to say that uh, Trip, I don't know because this is my 40th year in libraries and I've never been in a library that's banned a book. Yeah. Me either. Um. Overwhelmingly, of the 2,200 books that were banned last year, overwhelmingly, most of them were banned in schools. And just to add to that, um, while we have had situations here in Ohio where we've seen complaints or, or pop-ups, I can assure you we are still not nearly, not even close to our colleagues in Texas, Florida, Virginia, um, which I had to laugh in Virginia because the person who tried to sue not only the library, but also Barnes and Noble and others. When all the big law firms in New York came in, it was kind of funny. You had to kind of laugh at them, so. Excellent. Uh, a question back there at the yes. microphone. Renee Delane from Women Who Dare. Um, I have a question I hope you'll each of you will answer for all of us. What book as a child or as an adult has most influenced you or changed your life and why? I, I can do that one. Uh, uh, the Giving Tree. That was oh, nice. oh, all serious? right, go ahead. You go first. <laughs> no, go ahead. No. I, have an, I have another one. I have another one. I have another yeah. one. No, The Giving Tree, you know, that was a book that was read to me, and I, I still sort of get misty when my kids um, ask me to read it. So I'll, I'll give to you, yes, The Giving Tree, because it was something I always read growing up with my mother, which was very important to me. And I continued on with my kids today. And then also when I was in undergrad, uh, it was actually a book uh, my professor had me read, Day for Democracy, um, which was a very, very important book that still I still have on my shelf in my office that I refer to all the time. Why don't you ask me which child I like the best? Or <laughs> maybe uh, which of my favorite <laughs> library? Uh, 
<laughs> something simple. Um, what I would, and I use this example all the time because, I mean, we have two million books in the collection. I mean, I, I, I try to, to read as often as I can. The story I tell is when I was in ninth grade, a social studies teacher took me aside and gave me a copy of The Grapes of Wrath. And he said, I think you ought to read this. And I made the connection, even though he didn't say it, that he didn't give it to anyone else in the class. And I think for me, it showed not only the power of the book that I enjoyed, but the power of someone having the confidence in you to read a book that maybe you would have thought was beyond you, which is another reason not to put age restrictions on books. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really important point because I think we all have favorite books at different times in our life. Um, but, you know, it goes back and forth between, for me, uh, Catcher in the Rye or the autobiography of Malcolm X, depending on how angry I am one day. <laughs> so today it's Catcher in the Rye. You guys have made me all so happy. So they like book at, at that table. They like books that have been banned because <laughs> all the books they like. At this table, we're happy little kids' books about dying trees. And our wonderful Jane Scott back there. Jane. Oh, thanks, guys. Thanks. And yes, retirement is fabulous. Thank you. Uh, quick, quick question, maybe has a long answer. I haven't heard you talk about any national or statewide lobbying efforts that might get ahead of all of the other stuff that might be coming along. Um, I was intrigued by what you said about the Illinois legislature and their, um, I mean, they definitely took an offensive and got ahead of that. What other efforts statewide or nationally are being done? that I would tell you to look at. One is Penn International. I think they're in their 101st year, founded by authors in the UK, and I think founded a year later. If you go online, you'll see just some of um, the real lions of literature in the US that helped uh, found it in 1923. Um, and then there's a, I think it's a recently formed group, United Against Book Bans. And I looked at it um, in preparation for this, and, and there must be 50 agencies that are a part of it, and you can sign up individually to be a part of it as well. And, and I think, um, you know, that's the best. I, um, honestly, I don't want to see just the American Library Association do this, because I think it's much bigger than that. Yeah. It's all of us, and uh, I think there's strength in numbers. Yeah, I, I think booksellers, book publishers are coming to, to be a part of this. I think we're way behind, but I, I think they're, I'm happy to see that President Obama has started to really take the, come to the forefront on this issue. And folks like Jay-Z is coming in and putting money out and, you know, for it. And if Beyonce gets behind anything, it's all over then. So <laughs> that's all we need, right, is Beyonce. So just real quick, David, because I, I know we're getting close. Um, but at the end of June, you know, Felton mentioned um, the authors and, and pu publishers. We've had a freedom to read statement for over 70 years. We just celebrated it again at the end of June. And uh, there were a couple of press releases and announcements about it. But part of it was because for the first time at the national level, the Authors Guild, which represents authors and the Publishing Association, came and signed on. So it is that collective effort. Um, that, that hopefully will make a difference, so. Very quickly, I, I don't think there is a legislative fix to this issue, um, in part because of the way the law is set up. The law of First Amendment focuses on community standards. Uh, and we also have, you know, federalism and, and discretion among individual schools and libraries to determine what's appropriate in their community. Uh, this is a, a sort of grassroots political fix. And, and if you don't like what's going on in your school board, you have to run for school board. And, and that's the way that we as a collective will, will slowly uh, fight back against censorship. And, and at the end of the day, this, this issue is a canary in the coal mine for democracy. And um, you know, if we're not cognizant of it now, before you know it, it might be too late. Davis, one, uh, one real quick uh, comment. Um, our annual celebration of learning has really been fortunate to have some unbelievable authors. And uh, one year we hosted Azir Nafisi, whose book was Reading Lolita in Tehran. 
which talked about the women in Tehran book clubs who were reading materials that if, if found out would have been imprisoned or worse in Iran. And she gave this stirring speech, but she ended it with the raised fist, readers of the world unite. And I think that's kind of where we are on this issue. Thank you. On, on that note, wow, what a perfect note. Thank you, Patrick. I wish we had more time, but I've gotten the wrap-up single, so we're going to turn it back to CMC board meeting, member Amelia Robinson for concluding remarks. Amelia, take it away. Thank you, David. I hope you guys found today as a renewal of your love for libraries and the First Amendment. Um, for me, it was a reminder of how lucky we are to have facilities where we can go and get books for free that have been around for 150 and 154 years, respectively. I grew up in Cleveland, so I went to the library all the time. So thank you um, on behalf of little me. Um, thank you also goes to all the librarians in the room and people who work for libraries. So uh, thanks a lot for what you do. We really value you, even though it doesn't seem like it sometimes. We also want to thank today's sponsor, the Columbus Foundation and the Grange Insurance Auburn um, Center, Audubon Center, sorry, for hosting today. We also want to thank our virtual seat patrons, the Center for Human Kindness, and the Columbus Foundation, and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream. And our very special thanks goes to today's fantastic panel. We have Matthew Bessler. Got it right this time. I said, got it wrong. Bess. Besser. It's not that hard either. I'm not, I don't know. We also have Michelle Francis, Patrick Losinski, and I got you. See, I did you. I, I know you, so I should know your name. And uh, uh, Felton uh, Thomas Jr., and also our fantastic host, David Weaver. Please make sure to attend uh, the next CMC forum, which is re reimagining education in Ohio. It is just in time for the start of the next school year. Please also take a moment to answer the short survey that you'll find in your form flyer. We cannot do this without you. Thank you and have a fantastic afternoon.